I think if uh, the actions hadn't started when they started, it could have uh, been extinct now. Because we saw that many uh, small populations were going extinct as we were monitoring them. When I started to work on Arctic foxes in Scandinavia just after 2000, it was likely uh, 40 to 80 animals left in Scandinavia. So it was very low. It, uh, it was critically low. The Arctic foxes is a small fox. It's close to the size of a house cat. I think most of us think of the Arctic fox as the white fox. But in summer, they turn to brown. They are, of course, cute, like all foxes are. What is special with the Arctic fox is that it's very adapted to the cold, having a very thick fur and losing very little energy because they have rounded ears and snow. They could stand starvation for many, many, many days and live from limited resource availability. I really love to see them when they are out, and especially in the winter, because they are kind of like air. They jump in a very special way and they look happy. I am very touched by that, that uh, how they move and how they look and how they, how they are cope with the, these harsh uh, winters. The Arctic fox, it was very heavily hunted around late 1800, early 1900. Uh, the fur was, it was almost like a year's salary for a peasant boy, so it was very valuable. The Arctic fox population was protected in uh, 1930, and after that uh, the population has continued to decline, likely due to that it was a very low population when it was protected. The main problem with climate change is that it's affecting the Arctic fox main prey, the lemmings, because they uh, live in this subnival space below, uh, below the snow. It's very vulnerable to climate change. It's a true keystone species, actually, because it's bridging or holding so many species in, in the alpine and tundra ecosystems. And we also have the expand of the red foxes, which over the, at least the last 30 years has expanded very much into alpine and tundra habitats. Red foxes are the main competitor of, of Arctic foxes. We see that the Arctic foxes avoid establishing where the density of red foxes is high. And we also see that red foxes could kill both adult and young Arctic foxes. I think if uh, the actions hadn't started when they started, it could have uh, been extinct now because we saw that uh, many uh, small populations were going extinct as we were monitoring them. But in Norway, we wanted to try out captive breeding and release of foxes. So uh, that started in 2005. Uh, first, when we started the captive breeding program, uh, we had them in, in this uh, typical farm situation in the low land. And then we uh, had no success. And then when we moved the station up on the alpine uh, habitat, it, it's really, uh, it just turned quickly to a very great success. Uh, we had breedings the year after and, and the year after and, the, and all years to come. I think all young foxes have a character, uh, both in wild and in captivity. And we see that they keep their, uh, I could say the natural character is still there. They don't get like uh, typical um, zoo animals. Uh, they, are, they keep the, the wild nature and they play around. Some are very bold and some are very shy. They are always curious, foxes are curious, so, so they come, come quite close in, in the fences. They get some wild carcasses, like dead moose or dead uh, deer or a hare or uh, some birds that are dead. And of course, some lemmings are coming through the fences. And we see that they, they have this stereotypic behavior of hunting mice, which is very typical for, for uh, foxes, and they keep that. So they don't lose traits or hunting skills. So uh, we see that they uh, cope with that when they uh, are released in the wild. Actually, the first release I, I was joining, we were very curious. It was in the autumn and it was a very nice day with sun and, and it was kind of turning late evening and we had really put the foxes into the den, closing the entrances. And, and then we opened the entrances and two of the foxes came out and it took less than two minutes. It was having a lemming in its mouth. And then it was kind of, oh yes, this is going to work. <laughs> so I, I think we had never dreamed of, of that high success of the captive breeding. I think it's 43% uh, of those that we released that survive to being uh, recruits uh, for the population.
this first population that we released foxes in, all of a sudden we got some messages from, from our Swedish colleagues that they had seen uh, blue foxes, like in the blue winter fur. They hadn't had any blue foxes there before. They, they realized that they had got some Norwegian genes uh, coming in. And, and uh, that was actually two brothers. And they established in the Swedish population and contributed to so many um, new foxes. And that turned out to be a genetic rescue of a very inbred population that was founded on, on very few individuals from the, from the start. They were termed the Blues Brothers because they blue color, uh, of course. I mean, the, the foxes don't see the borders. And that's what we really have been doing also in Norway, Sweden, Finland, that we have been working together all the time having different uh, projects and programs that are connected and do different kind of actions in different areas. We have had the uh, supplemental feeding of the Arctic foxes and now it's more than 300 feeding stations all together in Norway, Sweden, Finland now. That is meant to kind of boost the population both in terms of survival and reproduction. We see that they use these feeding stations more in years when there are little lemmings uh, compared to uh, years where there are more because they prefer the lemmings if they are there. And that's really a happy feeling for us working so hard to get this population back uh, into a viable population. All the conservation actions in, in Fenoskandia is really a success story. And we see now that the population in, in Norway is just around 300. Uh, and together with Sweden, we are close to 500. And, and the growth rate is still a good growth rate on the population. And, and I think the success is a bit surprising. I mean, we've been working with this for more than 15 years now. Uh, my estimate is that we have 10, 15 years more to go to reach a viable population. So we need to get the numbers going up quite much more. These changes in uh, climate will, will affect very many species if we don't do anything. So I, I would hope that we could try to stop it and maybe restore uh, the impact that we have.